Good morning, and welcome to York Minster Citadel. On behalf of the Cauley family, we welcome you into a celebration of a life well and faithfully lived. You will have noticed from the prelude and from glancing through the bulletin for today that much of the music is upbeat. It will involve clapping, and this is because of the deep gratitude we all have for Ken, his life, his influence, and his relationship with Jesus. Not surprisingly, Ken organized this celebration of life. The scripture passages and congregational songs are his choosing. Ken loved the band, and he faithfully served for many years as a bandsman in addition to extensive leadership here within the church. And we do want to say thank you to the York Minster Citadel Band, its past and some longer standing members who are supporting this service with scripturally based intentional band selections and marches chosen by Ken. In 1 Corinthians 15, we hear these questions. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the hope of a believer. Ken believed in Jesus. He lived his life faithfully for Jesus, and he lived with hope that when he ceased to tarry here on this earth, he would live in eternity with Jesus. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Loving and merciful God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. The mystery of life and death is again before us, the reminder of our humanity and our mortality. We turn to you, our creator, governor, and sustainer, with a keen sense of loss. Through Jesus' life on earth, we know he too encountered loneliness, hurt, and suffering. And through his incarnation, we claim that you understand our grief. With deep gratitude, we remember the life of Ken. We thank you for the way he contributed to our lives as a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother, a cousin, and a friend. We will miss the warmth of the communion we shared with Ken, his smile, his hearty handshake, his warm hugs, his words of encouragement, his willingness to share of his skills and his gifts for your kingdom. As we experience the sting of death, may we also experience your comfort. As we feel our grief, may we also claim the hope of Jesus, who is the resurrection and life. We thank you for the completeness and healing Ken now experiences in you. We thank you that you have welcomed him home with the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. I invite you now to stand with me and join in our first song of hope, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
please be seated.
Thank you all for coming. It's so wonderful to see so many people who care so deeply about my family and grandfather. And thank you so much for the support that you have provided my family over this past few months. It really means a lot. When I think of Grandpa, I have so many great memories of him that have taught me so much. Memories of Maine, him driving me to practices, and so much more. But the story I want to share today is of our annual Christmas evening together. Every Christmas, we would have dinner at Grandma and Grandpa's house, and after dinner and dessert, Grandpa would always go upstairs to the washroom, and during this time, Santa Claus came down the stairs. <laughs> he then sat on the couch and in the TV room and reached into his bag of gifts and pulled out two Santa helper's hats. The first was a green hat, and the second was a beautiful Montreal Canadian Santa hat. Usually, Santa's helpers were, uh, were the two youngest and grandma. Santa would reach into his bag of gifts. Uh, the younger children would normally get an action figures or trucks. The older grandchildren would get a gift card and a Toblerone if they didn't have a nut allergy. And the ad adults would get a Toblerone bar. Dad and Uncle Matt would always have a possibility of getting coal depending on if their wives and children said they were good and somehow they always managed to get it. <laughs> After presents, Santa would always go uh, back to his reindeer, get a kiss from Grandma, and in the midst of this, have a possibility of losing his pants going up the stairs. <laughs> this is always my favorite part of Christmas, and this is a memory of Grandpa I will cherish forever. Where do I start? My grandpa has done so much for me and everyone, it's nearly impossible to pick just one story, but I have been limited to just one. The thing that stuck out for me the most is that he's taught me to stay a warrior and to never stop fighting. I am a Team Canada kickboxer, yet I'm not the best fighter in my family. My grandpa fought long and hard against cancer, a battle that we got told he would only last six months for and he turned. <laughs> <laughs> into a wonderful 18 months. <laughs> he was in so much pain. He stayed fighting as long and hard as he could. Despite the fact that it would have been easier and more pleasurable to just pass away. He made sure to stay and fight not for him, but so his family could get more time to spend with him and more time to process what's happening. It's relieving to know that he's in a better place now. But he has fought, taught me that Collie don't give up, as well as to never go down without giving it your all. Grandma, I know you're seeing this right now, and I just want to thank you for everything you've done. When I think of Grandpa, my favorite memory is our tribes. Whenever Grandpa would drive me somewhere that he didn't know, he always printed off the directions instead of using Google Maps. <laughs> At first I thought it was a little strange, but I realized that he took time out of his busy day to make sure that he was able to drive me where I needed to go and have a meaningful conversation without being distracted. Although I suck with directions, this is something that I will want to be able to do with my kids and grandkids to make them feel just as special as Grandpa made me feel. I found this poem that I would like to read to you all that's called A Letter From Heaven. <laughs> when tomorrow starts without me, and I'm not here to see if the sun should rise and find your eyes filled with tears for me, I wish so much you wouldn't cry the way you did today while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. <sighs> I know how much you love me, as much as I love you. And each time you think of me, I know you'll miss me too. When tomorrow starts without me, don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'm right there in your heart. Thank you.
When I think again, some words like this come to mind. Humble, reserved, patient, courteous, thoughtful, empathetic, trustworthy, and a good sense of humor. We really need look no further than his family to see the fruit of his example and his leadership. I've always thought of Ken as a chip off the old block. Many of you will remember Ken's father, Bill, an accountant with the Legal and General Insurance Company. He was transferred in 1954 from Toronto, I'm sorry, Montreal, to Toronto. Uncle Bill and my mother were siblings in a family of eight, seven girls and one boy. What a challenge. Poor Uncle Bill didn't even have a door on his bedroom. Our grandfather, William Cawley, born in 1865, was also an accountant with the London Life Insurance Company. When asked by business associates, Mr. Cawley, do you have a family? Yes, he would reply, I have seven daughters and every daughter has a brother. As a point of interest, my mother was the only one of the seven daughters to marry. As a result, we had seven maiden aunts who doed, dot, tried again, doted on us, the last of whom passed away in 2012 at the age of 97. And what a blessing they were to us. Our great-grandfather, one more generation, born in 1814 in Ballycanoe, Ireland. He left Ireland in 1850, the great Irish potato famine, along with another million people. The Quebec census of 1891 listed George as an accountant. Many of you will know that Ken graduated with a bachelor's degree in commerce from the University of Toronto and went on to further study as a chartered accountant. The line of accountants continues. I think it's safe to say that Ken was a chip off the old block. When Ken and family moved to Toronto, I ventured to Montreal alone. Um, before they moved to Toronto, I ventured to Montreal alone one Christmas as a teenager. During the week after Christmas, Ken and Negrat Ken and I agreed to meet at a park on the corner of Girward and Sherbrooke to play hockey, of course. After playing, we decided we needed something to eat. Ken suggested, let's go to the Swiss Chalet. It's right across the street. As I recall, chicken dishes at that time were finger dishes. You didn't have a knife and fork with which to eat. Some of you may remember that period of time. Anyway, we stuffed ourselves before waddling along Sherbrooke to the home of our aunties. 
When dinner was served, our plates came laden down. You guessed it, with chicken. <laughs> I looked at Ken, and Ken looked at me. We started to laugh. It became one of those situations in which our aunties laughed at us, laughing so hard. But we just kept laughing, attempting to hide our visit to the Swiss chalet. Perhaps you've experienced one of those situations where laughing becomes contagious. Before long, we were all in fits of laughter. The truth finally came out. We'd eaten dinner at the Swiss chalet at four o'clock. Once Ken's family moved to Toronto, we spent Christmases together. Every year, Uncle Bill and Andy Edna moved to Vancouver and that concluded to quite a degree the family Christmases. However, after dinner, we often were encouraged by our aunts to entertain. My sister Anne might offer a selection on the piano, and Ken might play a duet with Anne, and then we'd sing a few carols. However, my m favorite memory is the year Ken and Graham and Gordon and I decided to sing. What do we sing? I won't say who, but someone suggests, suggested, since it's Jesus' birthday, let's sing happy birthday to Jesus. Well, keep in mind, this is the 1950s. And when we sang happy birthday to Jesus, no, 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 it's not acceptable. That's sacrilegious. Well, we got through it. Some even laughed. As we have moved into retirement, Ken and I, we have managed to have lunch together much more frequently. In fact, eight mon 18 months ago, as we sat at lunch, Ken began to share with me the extent of his weight loss and the inability of the doctor to pinpoint the issue. How blessed we have been by those who have gone before us. And now, he has joined them. One thing I'm going to really miss is our late night chats, chats, which sometimes extended beyond the midnight hour. Ken was more than a cousin. He was a trusted best friend. Thank you for the family memories that have been shared with us already. And we're going to have a time to sing now one of Ken's songs. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. And I think particularly of uh, the memories, the recent memories just shared. And I draw attention to our second verse. While we walk this pilgrim journey, clouds may overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. That is Ken's hope. That is the hope of Jesus. So I invite you to stand with me. We'll sing all four verses straight through with the band. And I was asked to say that clapping is not just permissible, it is wanted. <laughs>
good. Good morning, folks. I should say that I'm the first in the line of uh, brothers and cousins that is not an accountant, in case you were wondering. Soon after, Matt took it up, my, my nephew. I'd like to say that I'm most appreciative of this opportunity to honor my brother's life today. You'll have to excuse me, however, for including some humor. I need to do that to get through it. I told Ken that many months ago, and he said fine and gave me a thumbs up. If you could listen in our house growing up in Montreal, you might hear the following. Graham, Graham, why can't you be more like your brother? Well, the, uh, the truth is, it was one hard act to follow. I knew it was going to be difficult when Ken came home, probably in grade three or four, and his report card read, in addition to getting all A's, Kenna is a little treasure. <laughs> <laughs> now, I had not even started school, but I knew following this guy was going to be tough. <laughs> and I want to take this opportunity, uh, this opportunity, opportunity publicly to apologize to all of Ken's teachers who thought they were getting another Ken. <laughs> I had a very special brother, both of us very different, with different routes to the finish line, but most respectful of each other. My mother often joked, at least I think she was joking, <laughs> that if Graham had been first, there may never have been a Ken. <laughs> Ken and I both laughed about that many times, and Ken always thanked me for letting him be first, and I assured him I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> My brother was good at every task he took on. Husband, father, grandfather, uncle, musician, accountant, sports, and of course positions that he took on here at the court. He covered all the bases, including piano accompaniments for the band and the singing company for many years. He gave faithful service as a salvationist and long-standing member of this core. But he was never conceited or full of himself in any way. He was quiet like my dad. He was smart, resourceful, and resolute with his decision making. Yet always respectful to others, a true gentleman and Christian. He was the person in our family that we all turned to for sound advice or encouragement, and a dad, husband, uncle, and brother we all looked up to. I doubt Ken had any enemies, just admirers. In dealing with Ken on core matters or family situations, his thought process was very, very clear with such sound judgment. I often thought he should have been in the legal profession as well as being a CA. He was meticulous in his planning, even for this day, which he knew was coming. Matt gave me a copy a few days ago of an obituary for Ken that Ken had written himself in his pre-planning. The last line of that obituary reads, a celebration of Ken's life is planned for 11 a.m. on Saturday with no date filled in. I knew my brother was smart, I just didn't know he had psychic powers. 
memories. I have such good memories of Ken and I growing up. Yes, some fights along the way, like most brothers do, and where younger brothers generally come up short. But good memories of playing road hockey on the street in Montreal with Ken's older friends, but he always stuck up for his younger brother. Memories of cheering together for the Canadians and the Alouettes, and I have to think he was very happy last Sunday. Memories of getting up very early on Saturday mornings after we had moved to Toronto and going down to North Lee School baseball diamond to play catch. He was always a Dodger. This was before the Blue Jays, of course, and I was always a Yankee. And other memories of Ken. Ken supporting me at my absolutely pathetic piano recitals. <laughs> telling me it will be better next year. <laughs> we both knew that was not going to be realized. And of course, memory spending time in the summer as kids in Ocean Park, Maine. And a special memory of that for those of us that go to Maine, you will be able to relate. A memory of our Uncle Henry Stevens, a soft-spoken and kind Salvationist from Montreal Citadel, taking Ken and I to the pier one afternoon. For non-Mainers, the pier is an amusement park on the beach in Old Orchard. Uncle Henry took us as his special treat and asked us what rides our parents usually let us go on and what games we were allowed to play. Ken looked at me totally seized the opportunity, <laughs> took over completely, explaining that we usually went on all the rides at least twice, played all the games when our parents would take us. Ken's deceit was quite evident that day, but what an afternoon we had. <laughs> we always talked about it, good times spent together as brothers and never forgotten. And of course, growing up here at Earl's Court and playing in the band together for so many years. The memorable Earl's Court band trip to the Salvation Army UK Centennial Celebrations in 1965. The first Salvation Army Canadian band to travel overseas since the Empress. And my brother, Ken, admirably, filling in from the solo horn section to proudly carry that brand new Canadian flag into the courtyard at Buckingham, <clears throat> Buckingham Palace as we marched in with the ISB to play before Queen Elizabeth. That was the first time that new Canadian flag had been marched into Bucking Buckingham Palace. What an honor for this Corps and of course, no better person to do it than Ken. And also, for those of us that played in the band together under Brian Ring, our very well-respected bandmaster, we, the younger guys in the band, were always so thankful that Ken was there to be Brian's billet partner, saving us from that fate. <laughs> I think Dean Ring is here. I, I apologize, Dean, but I think you'll understand. Brian, of course, who understood and read every person in the band, would, re would refer to Ken as feet planted firmly and just a solid individual. A few, a few years later, I recognized the time and effort that Ken and Donna both put into Chris's development, traveling many times to Philadelphia, where special care and programs were provided for Chris. The results and love evident in the fine person Chris is today as our official York Minister greeter here on Sundays. My only regret, and I'm sorry that Ken will not be able to see it, Chris will be a member of John and Am's wedding party next year when they get married. 
In the early 80s, as this core transitioned from Dufferin and St. Clair to a temporary location in Forest Hill, and then to our new church here at York Minster, Ken put in countless hours as building chairman and along with our CEO, Harvey Canning, and property secretary, Bill Kerr. They are solely responsible for the enjoyment we have today in this beautiful church building. Probably one of the nicest SA Corps buildings anywhere in the country and located at the heartbeat, Young and Highway 401. What vision they had. Ken and others made this happen for all of our benefit and we enjoy this beautiful church today because of that. And Ken was adamant adamant that while we were moving into a beautiful, rebuilt church, we would still be a traditional Salvation Army Corps. And therefore the name, the Salvation Army York Minster Citadel. We are told and believe God gives in abundance and takes back whatever we offer in time, talents, and treasures. And that was Ken, talented and always giving back with his time to this core. Like my dad before, and like our grandfather before that in Montreal. For our family, Liz, John, and Katie, we have lost a loved and respected uncle and brother-in-law. I had just dropped Katie at the airport very early Tuesday morning on her way to Arizona. And when I returned to my office, I got a call from Greg telling me that Ken had passed on. We gave Katie the news in the afternoon after her arrival in Arizona and gave her the option to come back or stay, her choice. No hesitancy on Katie's part. She arrived home again uh, last Thursday night, and that was just the kind of quiet influence and respect Ken had on others, and you can also see that influence and impact he had on others as influenced by all of you here today out of respect and love for Ken and Donna. For me personally, I have lost a brother, friend, and mentor. The best man at my wedding and me at his wedding. My best man who is driving me to this church for my wedding and I commented to him, Ken, we're running late as we sat on a February Friday afternoon on the 401. Ken replied without even looking, Graham, you're 10 years late. Another 10 minutes won't matter. <laughs> I followed Ken at Earl's Court into the band and then followed Ken as band secretary for many years and now followed Ken as property chair here at York Minster. And I can, assure, I can assure all members of this Corps that Ken and Alan take very seriously the management of the finances of this Corps, entrusted with the responsibility of your tithes. Now sometimes trying to get money to replace or add to the building can be challenging. I drove Ken to our Christmas concert here with the Corps last year. And we go, when we got out of the car, he commented on how dark the parking lot was. I reminded him that I had been asking for funds to replace the outdoor lighting and he had not approved this. <laughs> he answered, always had an answer, Ken. You don't always have to listen to me. We put you in this job because you know how to get around things, okay? 
I'm happy to say we now have new outdoor lighting. <laughs> I'll miss that dry humor. Ken and I had opportunity for different one-on-one -on -one times talking since his diagnosis of 15 months ago. I can tell you Ken did not want to leave this life on earth. But he absolutely was not afraid to embrace what he believed was waiting for him. He planned for this eventuality and accepted gracefully the outcome. And for Major Cameron's service last week, God's message to us, do not fear, you are redeemed. Or in the language of today, don't worry, I have your back. I can assure you Ken knew, and he believed that. NBC have a TV show called Sunday Today with host Willie Geist, which Liz and I have on as we get ready for church. Each week, they highlight a person who has recently passed on, but has quietly made significant contributions to others over their lifetime. It is entitled, A Life Well Lived. And I think my brother definitely qualifies. Ken will be sadly missed by Donna and all of his family, and certainly by this core. The call, and now the vacancy, is officially out there for someone to replace him and work here at the core with Alan Smith. So step up. You can talk to Stephen or Corin or Alan after the service. <laughs> I wanted to close with words from our essay songbook. And as I looked through, I realized so many of the songs we sing were applicable to Ken's life. But I settled on the chorus of 848, His Way is Best. And that chorus reads, I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands. Whatever the future holds, I'm in his hands. The days I cannot see have all been planned for me. His way is best, you see, I'm in his hands. I know Ken believed that and was at peace with his life and his contributions on this earth. I am so thankful for this opportunity to honor my brother publicly and so thankful I was lucky enough to have him as my older brother. And very simply, in conclusion, it was a life well lived. Thank you. My name is Lucas, and these are my brothers, Nathan and Noah. We loved our grandpa. We'll never forget how we used to spray whipped cream all over our mouths every time we came over for a big family dinner. Take us to the store in Maine for him to buy newspaper and for us to buy treats. And to get us McDonald's every time we came over for a sleepover. In a, in a few minutes, the band will play a piece called Light of the World. The piece is based on two Bible passages. These passages talk about how Jesus wants to know us, know us and share a light with us. The first passage is from the book of John, chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
The second passage is from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 20 to 22. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you very much for being in attendance today, as well as those who are watching on the live stream. It means a great deal to our family that you are celebrating my dad's life with us. I wanted to share with you a bit about what my dad was like as a husband and father. I arrived on the scene to a chaotic household. My earliest memories of my dad was that he was strict. I remember thinking as a young boy that he wouldn't let me get away with much. I have a number of early memories of my childhood, and I actually remember how tight he put my diapers on me. <laughs> Those things weren't coming off no matter what I did. I remember getting into trouble from him one time when he found out that I was hopping in and out of my crib. He caught me running around upstairs and after he'd put me to bed, and he chased me around the top of the stairs and, I, I, and watched me as I hopped right back into my crib. Shortly thereafter, I had a big boy bed. I didn't realize that I had arrived into a situation where both parents were working and living in a world that this might not be the norm, or that they had three young and rambunctious boys, and I didn't even realize that I had a brother with special needs. As a parent now, I realized that I was witnessing a very chaotic time in both my parents' lives, and my dad was doing his best to make sure that we learned from an early age on how to behave and treat others with respect. And when my dad wanted you to behave, all it took was a stern look from him. No words, just a look, and it was enough for one to understand that whatever it is you were doing, you should stop and be good. Raising a family in the early 1980s meant that technology was changing and that many family events and occasions could be captured in a number of different ways. I remember when he got a video camera, which he used to record our family events on tape. Note that these were even before when VHS tapes became popular. The camera he had kind of looked like what a television news camera operator would use today, filming a news segment on the street, complete with a microphone and a very bright light. This camera would record many of our Christmas mornings and vacations. I recall watching these videos years later and laughing at the fact that the light on the camera was so bright on a Christmas morning that we couldn't even look directly at the camera. He also brought this camera on our annual family vacations to Maine and brought it down to the beach. Months after our vacations, we would invite our extended family over to watch the videos. And we would chuckle when we noticed that my dad sometimes got distracted by, by some of the cute girls in bikinis <laughs> while trying to capture us playing in the sand. His commitment to our family extended to our extracurricular activities. He was always attending our baseball and hockey games and even coached some of our hockey teams and was a co-convener of our hockey league for a couple of years. He always attended our school music concerts as kids and as Greg graduated university and became a music teacher, he was very dedicated to going to his concerts and listening to his groups play. His encouragement of his kids even extended to my wife Lindsay when he attended her convocation acknowledging her becoming a CPA and winning the gold medal as the top writer on the CPA exams at Ontario. Something he was so proud of her for. My dad also had attention to detail that was such a strength and showed through his academic and professional career. An example of his attention to detail came to light when we recently found in his records a printout of the terms and conditions for his use of Google Chrome as an internet browser. <laughs> He didn't agree to anything without reading the fine print. <laughs> and his attention to detail never waned. And as I was preparing for this tribute, my brother Greg reminded me of a moment we have on video that I wanted to share with you all today that highlights an important moment for our family, but one that also just demonstrates how detail-oriented he was. Thank <laughs> you. 
The look of shock that was on his face when he told him we were expecting twins was basically how I felt for the month prior to us making that announcement to our family. And I hate to say it, but I didn't even notice myself that there were two babies in that photo. And I was the one in the room with the technician who was pointing it out to me. Having my wife, Lindsay, and my sister-in-law, Elizabeth, join our family definitely introduced a new dynamic for us. My mom wasn't outnumbered anymore. I remember the night of my brother's wedding, coming home with my parents and sitting in the living room, feeling a bit of emptiness. I explained to my parents how I felt like Greg had left us. And I really appreciated my dad's perspective then. He told me that he didn't see it as losing a son, but rather gaining a daughter. My dad's relationship with both of his daughter-in-laws was extremely special and also brought some maturity to our house. No rough housing was allowed when they were there. He always treated Lindsay and Elizabeth with such care. And it's from him that both Greg and I learned how to be gentlemen. Adding Lindsay and Elizabeth to the family also meant grandchildren. Six of them, in fact. My dad was a wonderful grandpa and so much more easygoing with the grandkids than he was with Greg, Chris, and I. He was so proud of them and attended every game, school, concert, and competition he could, as well as providing countless hours of babysitting and chauffeuring. He also loved to spoil them, especially in Maine. For almost a decade, he would take all six grandkids and Chris to the corner store daily, letting them pick up whatever they wanted. When Lucas returned home with a $30 bracelet made of sea glass, Lindsay and I told him that he had to set some limits or the kids would bankrupt him. So my perspective of my dad was that he had many sides to him. He was a guy who was strict and worked hard to raise a family that was kind, a guy who liked to have fun, a guy who was committed, and a guy who was very detail-oriented. But as I reflect on my dad, it is his deep and special relationships that stand out. When my dad decided to no longer continue with chemo this past August, it was a decision that I had been expecting for months. It was a logical thing for him to do. In going to the appointment, I knew that this conversation was coming, and I was prepared for it. So when the doctor left the room, Greg, Elizabeth, and I stepped out as well to give my parents some time to discuss what they should do next. After what felt like hours, we went back into the room to chat with him about his decision. What I wasn't prepared for, however, was how my dad used the opportunity to express to us how much he loved my all. <laughs> I knew my parents loved each other. They fell in love as teenagers and had a wonderful marriage. Genuinely kind to, genuinely kind to each other and always putting each other first. Even as a kid, I knew that they were true partners. They were together for almost seven decades and married for over 56 years. So despite having all this background about them, to hear them just express their love for one another as they made this difficult decision not to continue with the chemo just showed me how blessed they were to have this special relationship. The relationship with my mom was not the only special relationship my dad had. From an early age, my brother Chris called my dad his best friend, and my dad absolutely was best friends with Chris. My dad played a pivotal role in raising Chris to be a loving and kind person. As many of you know, Chris is pretty good at giving compliments to people. Like, oh, you're so beautiful. Or, I like your coat. He would often rope my dad into the compliment by openly asking my dad in front of the person what he thought. <laughs> oh, you're so beautiful. Hey dad, what do you think? <laughs> Thankfully, my dad mastered navigating those conversations. 
And whether it was taking Chris to the amusement park on our, every night on our vacation or playing over 3,000 games of the board game Trouble, my dad was committed to prioritizing time with Chris every day. And that time resulted in building the building of one of the most genuine and beautiful relationships that was noticed by all. And while these special relationships are such a beautiful thing to witness, it, is, it was his love and faith in God that was truly special. When we faced difficult times as a family, my dad was always a source of calm for us. And that came from the trust he put in Jesus. Even as he faced the reality that he was not going to be getting better from his cancer, he often spoke to people about his faith and provided, how his faith provided him comfort and peace. His unwavering faith is the basis on which he lived his life and laid the groundwork for how he treated others. While we're truly saddened and miss his presence, we know that he is at peace living his eternal life at the right hand of God. I love you, Dad.
My wife and I feel very honored uh, to be here. We've only really been part of the York Minster family for three months. And uh, so pleased that uh, in the time that we've been here that we've been able to visit with Ken and uh, to really understand the truth behind Matthew's tribute that uh, when I saw Ken, he spoke about his faith so very often, right from the very beginning in our meeting. But Ken, even in these last stages, was very focused on uh, what needs to happen and what I need to do as a core officer <laughs> here at York Minster. Uh, our first meeting was in August, and he said, Stephen, you have five things that I need you to do. Um, I've got partway through the list. But uh, my, uh, my promise to the family is I will complete that list in the next little while. We've just heard a wonderful selection from the band. This was chosen by Ken. And the musical theme woven through this selection was the hymn tune, Aurelia. So many uh, different Salvationists will associate different hymn tunes with this. What I love about the Salvation Army is we don't play a piece of music just for its musicality and music's sake. There is always words tied behind Salvation Army banding. And so one of the words uh, that you could associate with this tune, Aurelia, is the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her. For his life he died. But those are not the words we associate with Aurelia in this tune. For years, when I played Light of the World, I associated these words. O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. Good words, but also not the words uh, that uh, we associate with the band selection, Jesus, Light of the World. The composer of the band selection, Sir Dean Gothen, had other words in mind. And uh, I received on my first visit with Ken a 43-page outline of what uh, his uh, celebration of life was to be. And he had all the score notes for what was going to take place in the selections that he had chosen. And the words that Dean Goffin, after looking at this picture, Jesus, the Light of the World by Holman Hunt, these are the words from our songbook 614 that we associate with this band selection. O oh, Jesus, thou art standing outside the fast closed door, in lowly patience waiting to pass the threshold o'er. Shame on us, Christian brethren, his name and sign who bear. O oh, shame, thrice shame upon us to keep him standing there. The scripture that was read for us earlier is what is associated these words from. Jesus says, Behold, or here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Another verse that is associated with the band selection from that same song from 614 is this. O Jesus, thou art pleading 
in accents meek and low, I died for you, my children. And will you treat me so? O Lord, with shame and sorrow, we open now the door. Dear Savior, enter, enter, and leave us never more. Ken opened up the door to Jesus in his life. He accepted Jesus' promise of abundant and everlasting life, and Ken wanted to share his love of Jesus with others. Not only those in his family, I believe he considered Earl's Court and York Minster a greater part of his family. And we think of that third verse, Jesus pleading with us to open up that door. I was speaking with Bill Gibson last night at um, the visitation here at York Minster Citadel for Ken. And he was just talking about the wonderful things Ken meant as a pillar of the York Minster Corps. And he said, Ken was not outgoing. Ken was quiet. Ken was confident. And Ken lived out his relationship with Jesus so that everybody could see it, but not in a loud way. Ken, I would say, lived something called sacramentally. His life was lived in dedication to Jesus. And we have heard so many different songs from the band, and we've sung songs today. I have another song from the songbook that I want to leave with us today. And it's song 610. This is how Ken lived his life. My life must be Christ's broken bread. My love, his outpoured wine. A cup or filled, a table spread beneath his name and sign. That other souls, refreshed and fed, may share his life through mine. Ken was a faithful Christian who lived his life as an example to show us where we can find light of forgiveness, light of fellowship with our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, and light that we can share with the rest of the world. Because Ken lived this way, he lived a life of victory. And I would love to be the one who is leading the final song, which is Victory in Jesus, because I would sing the chorus with you 20 times. My wife is a little more reserved, but I'm sure we'll sing it more than once. Ken lived a well life. We are blessed to have known him, and we will be blessed to follow him. God bless his memory. And God bless his family and this church in the name of Jesus. And so as Stephen alluded to, our final song this morning truly is a song of celebration and a celebration of hope. Ken lived his life for Jesus. He lived his life for his family. And he dedicated his life in the name of Jesus to his whole life, but particularly to this church. 
and he lived his life with hope. And as Christians, we believe that we will live a life in eternity where the sorrow and pain of this world come to an end. And these are the final words of this final song we'll sing today. I heard about a mansion he has built for me that he built for Ken in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story in some sweet day I'll sing up there the songs of victory. Please stand and we'll sing it straight through with a few choruses at the end.
Hallelujah. Before we sing our benediction, we have just a few brief announcements. There will be a light lunch downstairs in our fellowship hall with an accessible entrance off our parking lot just here to the right. Our benedictory prayer will include a blessing over this lunch. So once you get downstairs, please help yourself to the food. The internment will be at the Elgin Mills Cemetery at Leslie and Elgin Mills at half past two. And the funeral director will be giving us further instructions about this at the conclusion of the reception. Immediately following our sung benediction, please remain standing for the recessional. Shall we pray? Our Lord, we claim your promise that your peace you give to us. Your peace you leave with us. Throughout this day, may we lean into your peace and find our strength in it. As we move downstairs for a time of fellowship, may we be mindful of your peace-filled presence with us. Bless the food and the faithful hands that have prepared this. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stay standing with me and join in in the singing of a sung benediction, the first verse of God be with you until we meet again. Thank <laughs> you.